Well, hey guys, welcome back to our, our There's Something About Bible Study. And we're in 1 John. Today we're going to start in chapter 2, verse 18, and we're going to complete, we're going to wrap up chapter 2 today. So jump in with me on, on verse 18. Before we do that, though, let me remind you, when we come out of the last verses from the last teaching, we, we come out of do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, comes not from the Father, but from the world, the world and its desire will pass away, but whoever does the will of God will live forever. We're coming out of that in the last, uh, the last lesson. And so when we jump into de- to today's lesson, what we're jumping into is what happens if we give into the world? Why do people give into the world? And how do we stand against the, the, the tendency that we have to give into the world? And so that's really what we're dealing with. So jump into verse 18. And it says, dear children, again, I remind you, this means he's speaking to people who are new in the faith. Dear children, this is the last hour. And as you have heard the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. Understand this. There are many people out there who want to teach you something other than what Christ taught you. They want to lead you to a Messiah other than Jesus, who is the Messiah, who is the Christ. I need you to hear me. If you are trusting anything else to save you, to lift you up, to carry you through, if you are trusting anything else to redeem you or to somehow fulfill you or complete you, anything other than Christ, you, you stay with me now. I'm not picking. I just want, I just want you to unpack this. You're kind of leaning into the whole antichrist thing. And I'm going to be, I'm going to be honest. There's a lot of folks out there who literally qualify as antichrist because they are speaking against Jesus. They're saying Jesus is not the Christ. They're saying that God is not real. They're saying that Jesus is not the answer for our sins. That is the definition of antichrist. Do me a favor. Let go of your image in your mind of one person who rises up and who, st- who, who becomes like the devil incarnate. You know, the whole, all the, all the horror movies from, I mean, look, I'm going to age myself, but all the way back to the omen, all the way through when they show this one person that rises up and they call him Antichrist. Listen, that may happen, but in the end, what we need to understand is anybody who denies the Christ Anyone who denies Jesus, anyone who denies the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, anyone who does that is living in the spirit of Antichrist. And the enemy has a simple goal. The enemy's goal is to lead us astray, is to lead us away from the Jesus that can save us. Why? Because... The devil has been Jesus' enemy from the start. When, when Lucifer rebelled against all of the other angels, the truth is he became an enemy of God. And therefore, Lucifer, who we now know as Satan or the devil, the enemy of our souls, he is opposed to Christ and wants to keep you away from him. He knows what his future is, and he wants to take you into his future with him. His desire is to lead you astray. There's nothing redeemable inside of the desire of, the, uh, of Satan to lead us astray from Christ. He's just trying to take us away from the salvation that Jesus has for Really offered us. The truth is the enemy desires to lead us astray. But watch, I, I want you to be careful because quite often we're looking again for this one big person who's going to get elected to some big office, who's going to be in charge of it all, and that's the Antichrist, and he's, we're, we're looking for that. But I look at this next verse. This is how we know it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going shows that none of them belong to us. I want you to know the enemy's desire is to lead you astray. But here's the second thing I want you to know from this. The error often comes from within the church. The error often comes from the truth. In other words, look, I heard a pastor say it this time one time. The devil doesn't whisper into the ear of any long-term Christian and say, go murder somebody. The devil doesn't start us there. He does not start by saying, go kill somebody, go murder somebody, go commit some heinous sin. The devil does not start us there. The devil starts by slowly taking away our commitment to the core truths of who Jesus is. The devil begins by slowly moving us one step at a time away. Therefore, an awful lot of the spirit of Antichrist, stay with me, can exist inside the church. And the church itself becomes the place that incubates some of these things. I can tell you that I have met with pastors 
who seemed to I, look. I, I we were we were planning a, cr a crusade, and a, and a guy in town, really great guy, a pastor, a, a, a strong church, but but I said I said we're going to try to get people saved in this in this in this crusade. His response to me was this: I don't know about all that saved stuff, but if you can get churches to work together, I'm in. Oh, you know what he was saying to me? He, he was dismissing the power of the Holy Spirit. He was dismissing the power of the blood of Christ. And what I found out later was his doctrine was very much one that, that Jesus was just a good teacher and that we should follow him because he taught good things. And so he was just trying to make people better people. He wasn't really all that interested in the eternal or in salvation or in the actual washing away of sin or in the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. He didn't believe in any of that. Y'all, sometimes the error comes from within the church, and we've got to understand that, but it will eventually show itself, and they will leave. You say, well, we've got to stop them from leaving. No, 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 no. I, I, I love, I, look, old writers of commentaries, dude, they are brutal. And so, so I read one commentary that was like, that, that was like when they leave, it is, it is a fresh wind of purification within the body of Christ. <laughs> I mean, and, and I got to tell you, been there a couple of times in my ministry where, where there was a blessed departure. And, and I need you to understand when somebody is opposed to Christ, when somebody is opposed to unity in the body, when somebody does not teach the truth of who Jesus really is, when they leave, that is not a loss. It only shows that they were never really with us to start with. And so they took off and they left. The error comes out of truth. Well, how do I keep from falling into that error? Listen to what he says next. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and all of you know the truth. I do not write to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do, and because you do know it, and because no lie comes from the truth. You do know the truth. Well, you do know the truth, and you do know, you're able to recognize, watch, through the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit inside of us we are able to recognize when we see an error in teaching. We're able to recognize when we see a church or a church leader going the wrong way. The Holy Spirit guides us, and that's what I want you to catch here. The Holy Spirit is our hope of retaining truth. If we don't have the Holy Spirit inside of us, surrendered to him so that when the Holy Spirit says to us, this is wrong, don't go there. This is bad, don't go there. This is wrong teaching, don't listen to it. This is, hey, go correct that brother, he's saying this wrong. Go correct that sister, she's doing this wrong. If we don't have the Holy Spirit inside of us guiding us, we don't have any hope of retaining truth because the world around us right now, and I, I'm, I, I'm certain the world has been this way before, okay, so I'm not, I'm not calling in, end of time, but the world around us right now is so given over and controlled by the spirit of Antichrist that we are just saturated. We're just surrounded. We are, we are enveloped by this Antichrist spirit that just dominates our culture. And if we don't have the Holy Spirit inside of us checking us and checking our thoughts and checking what's going on, the Word of God stored up in our hearts and stored up in our minds, if we don't have that, we don't stand a chance. I want you to know, I don't want, everybody stay with me, I don't want you to spend time in prayer and to spend time in the Word of God simply to make you a good person. Because I think becoming a good person for the sake of becoming a good person is no different than my pastor friend who wasn't worried about salvation. He just wanted churches to work together. I, I don't want you to do I want you to do that because two reasons. Number one, it's the only way you are going to avoid getting caught up in the spirit of Antichrist that is so prevalent and dominant around us. We must have the Holy Spirit. We must have the Word of God. We cannot survive without it. Not in this culture, not in this moment. But secondly, I, I want you to do that because we must speak the truth to the world around us. This dominant presence of, of Antichrist is, is, eating up, is eating up our people. It's, it, it's eating up our neighbors. It's swallowing up so many people. I, I got to tell you, I watch Christians try to wrap themselves in pretzels almost, in knots almost, to try to describe how they're still Christians, but they're following the spirit of, they're, they're clearly following the spirit of Antichrist that is in the world around us. And they'll tie themselves in doctrinal or theological knots 
just to try to say, well, I, I, I don't want to disagree with the world, but I want to follow Jesus. Look, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says don't love the world. Don't get into what the world has, has distorted of God's truth. Don't, don't give in to any of that. That's the spirit of Antichrist. But we're going to need the Holy Spirit to get, a, get us through that. I have good news because he, tell us, he tells us here, but you have an anointing from the Holy One. You have the Holy Spirit in you guiding you. That's what can hold us strong. Who is the liar, he says. You say, well, how, how am I even going to know? Well, he asked the question. Who is the liar? It is whoever denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a person is the Antichrist, denying the Father and Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Anyone who denies that Jesus is the Christ. Now, I want you to hear me. Uh, there are some... You, you take a Karl Marx out there who would say there is no God, Jesus is a liar, although he would say those things, right? There, there are many, many, many people around us who fall in that category. Inside of the church, there are a few people who will say it that way. What they will say is, well, you know, Jesus is just one pathway to God. Jesus is just one pathway to heaven. Really, all paths lead to heaven. All paths lead to God. That's denying that Jesus is the Christ. The Bible is clear on this. There is only one way into heaven. There is only one way. And Jesus says he is the way, the truth, and the light, and no one comes to the Father except through him. There's only one way. When you begin to say, well, you know, maybe you could get there through this one, or maybe you could get there through that one, or maybe you, that, it, listen to me, inside of the church, I know you're well-meaning. I get it. I'm not saying there's evil in your heart. I'm saying evil has started to steal your mind because the truth is Jesus is the only way to heaven. And even inside the church, when we start teaching something else, we begin to embody the spirit of Antichrist. We must recognize falsehood when we see it. And it's really not complex. Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the answer. There are no more answers. He is the way to get to heaven. He is the way to get to the Father. He is the salvation. He is our only hope for overcoming what, what, what is damaging our hearts and what is destroying the world around us. Jesus is the answer. And if you start claiming anything else as the answer, you are, you are leaning into the spirit of Antichrist. And we've got to be careful about that. I'm not trying to start some kind of inquisition in the church. I'm just telling you, if we preach anything but Jesus and Him crucified and risen... We, we mess up because Jesus is the answer. There's an old song, dating myself a number of times today. There's an old song by a dude named Steve Green that says people need the Lord. That is absolutely true. It's still true today. All people, everybody, everywhere, they need Jesus because Jesus is the answer. Let's keep going. You say, well, well what am I supposed to do now? Keep going. Down, the next verse starts with, as for you, See that what you have heard from the beginning remains in you. See that what you have heard from the beginning. Look, first point, you got to remain. And I, and I look, I, I don't want to give like a five point, uh, do these five things in order to, you know what remain means? Stay with me now. This is going to be deep theological. You ready? Remain means don't leave. Stay. Be there. Remain in Christ. See to it that what you have heard from the beginning remains in you. In, in, in the Gospel of John, in Jesus' life, you get this, this, this analogy he gives of, of the vine and the branches. And Jesus says in that, in, that, in that moment, he says, remain in me, stay in me. Don't separate yourself from the vine, which is Jesus, because if you do, there's no life coming through the branch and the branch will just die and wither and fall off and ultimately be good for nothing but the fire. You understand what he's saying, right? Remain in me or you're going to end up burning. I, I, look, look I, I know, I know, I know. I took, I took a story that's beautiful and I made it hard. But the truth is, the harsh truth is there. We've got to understand that. Remain in him. If it does, you also will remain in the Son and in the Father. And this is what he promised us, eternal life. I'm writing these things to you about those who are trying to lead you astray. He's trying to warn us. Listen to his warning. Remain and listen. Listen to his warning because there are people out there trying to lead us away from the Christ who wants to save us, who died to save us. Remain in him and listen to his warning. 
As for you, the anointing you received from, from him remains in you. And you do not need anyone to teach you. Why? Because the Holy Spirit will teach you. We're learning together. Y'all, I got to tell you, over time, my goal is not that you learn that we're smart here as pastors at New Life. My goal is that you learn that you can pick up the Word of God and you can read it and you can understand it because that's what matters. You can learn this. You, you don't need anyone to teach you. Listen to the Holy Spirit. But as His anointing teaches you about all things and as that anointing is real, not counterfeit, just as it has taught you, remain in Him. You got to keep growing. I'm going to give you four of these. Remain, listen, grow. Remain, listen, and grow. And now, dear children, he says, continue in him so that when he appears, we may be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who does what is right has been born of him. Remain in him. Listen to the Holy Spirit and the word of God. Grow in your walk with him. Constantly be striving to be growing and be better and better and better every day. And then live your life surrendered to Christ, guided by the Holy Spirit, never giving in to spirit of Antichrist, never giving in to other truths, never giving in to the, the spirit of Antichrist that has surrounded and enveloped us as a culture. Do not love the world or anything in the world. Do not allow yourself to be led astray by it. Do not allow yourself to be led astray by some good sounding doctrine that maybe you think will make Christianity less offensive. Folks, Christianity is simple. You are broken. You are a sinner. Jesus died on a cross to pay the price of your sins. He rose from the dead to set you free from the power of death and hell. And now he offers you salvation and eternal life. You simply have to receive it. You cannot receive it from anyone but him, but you can always receive it from him. It's not a difficult truth. Listen to me. It is often offensive. You can't take that offense away because Jesus is the answer. All right, so verse 18, jumping right in, talking about the Antichrist is coming, um, talking about that we know it's the last hour. So the first century church knew it was the last hour then. Right. It's been a little bit. Right. So we're still in the last hour. Yeah, it's but the longest I, hour of history. <laughs> no, no, no. Can, but can I say something? We keep saying things like that. The church keeps saying things like that. But we're talking about God. Mm -hmm. He's been... His hours are long. Forever, right? <laughs> so the whole existence of the earth, mm -hmm. get, can I get, process this? The whole existence of the earth is a blip in time for him. Yeah, that's facts. <laughs> you know, I get so, it. Yeah. Well, anyway, I just wanted to say that, that we, we need to remind people that the last hour could be a lot longer. Yes. We could be in minute 20 of that hour. Right? Yeah. You know what right, I mean? Right, right. So anyway, I just want to give people that. But the Antichrist discussion, you... I thought you broke this down very well. You're talking about that verse where it says that, you know, they did not really belong to us because they left, essentially. Mm -hmm. Yes. And um, I think it's important to point out that, like, you can leave a church and go to another good church and still love Jesus and not be the Antichrist. Mm -hmm. I just yes. wanted to point that yes. out. Right? Fair enough? Fair enough. What, we, what it seems like is happening here is that these people, he, these people are embodying Antichrist ideas because they come to a place, they're in fellowship, they're worshiping, but they come to this place, this idea that Jesus actually isn't God. And that's mm -hmm. what he's been talking about from the beginning of the book. And, and at this point, he's getting into probably, he's got specific examples in mind yes, of people who have left. He does. You think so? I do. And, and, and it, clearly they've left for that reason, right? The question I have is getting into the discussion about not just denying that Jesus is the Christ or that he is God, but there's a lot of people who will, who will deny some of the things that Jesus taught. Hmm. They'll deny some of the things, they'll not do some of the things he commands us to do, or they'll say that they disagree with some of his teachings, but they'll say, oh no, he's God for sure. Is that an antichrist too? Yes. <laughs> I was actually you, you're taking me where I wanted to go where I would like to go with this which is uh, which is antichrist is not I grew horns and I grew a tail and my skin turned red mm. okay that's not antichrist antichrist is I have diminished the power and the place of Christ in the overall scheme of salvation and how to live mm -hmm. and and I think I think 
I, I will say it is possible to leave a good church and go to another good church and not be antichrist. I just need to say that happens all the time, happens every day. Mm -hmm. uh, people, there, there's a time frame. Every, everything has a shelf life. There are some, most people don't stay in the same church their whole lives, but most people are not the Antichrist. Okay? Right. Mm -hmm. But spirit of Antichrist can be much simpler than we make it. Spirit of Antichrist can be, I want to take the offense out of the gospel. I'll tell you a story. Years ago, I mean, I just started in ministry. And we were doing a pictorial directory. Do y'all remember those? Mm -hmm. And so wow. we were doing a pictorial directory. This is forever ago. So Olin Mills, you don't even know that phrase, but a lot of you do. <laughs> Olin Mills came to do the directory and they sent a photographer. Wow. I asked the photographer, I said, uh, I said, well, what church do you go to? Because I was there with her all day because I was managing the thing. And she said, well, here was her exact phrase. I've never forgotten it. Well, I used to be Baptist, but it conflicted with my lifestyle. So now I'm Catholic. Hmm. Interesting. I'll never forget that hmm. because it shocked me. I was 23, 20, probably 23. Yeah. And, and I, I was just shocked. How, how could you, you don't, you don't conform your God to fit your lifestyle. You conform your lifestyle to fit your God. That's an absolute truth, by the way. But if you conform your God to fit your lifestyle, you can still say Jesus is Lord, but you've robbed him of, of, of the truth that he is because mm -hmm. anything he says in the Bible that conflicts with the lifestyle you want to live, you've now taken away and said he was wrong about that. Yeah, and this is... Uh, that's, that's Antichrist. That's what I was getting at because Jesus seems to say some of these things too. It's almost like John here is... is repeating in different words the same idea of Jesus mm -hmm. being like many will come to me in that day mm -hmm. right. and will say Lord Lord did I not do all these things in your name but I'll say depart from me you workers of lawlessness I never knew you right. could it be that yes I could say that I believe that I that I could be convinced even in my own mind that I believe that Jesus is Lord that he is the son of God but not have had a transformation on the interior Yes, that my I could not be what we call regenerate, you know, yeah. saved, uh, transformed in my spirit. Yeah, I believe there are people. It's very possible. In fact, I, I, I think I've met these people, who they really do have a salvation mm -hmm. experience, mm -hmm. blood washed in the church, but they never fully surrendered to what the Holy Spirit was doing in their heart, and therefore, because they never fully surrendered to what the Holy Spirit was doing in their heart, they did not develop. They did not grow. And it's not unlike a plant you put in your yard. And it's planted. Mm -hmm. It's there. But for some reason, it doesn't take good root and it doesn't thrive and it just withers. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's just gone. And, and I, I think there are a lot of people who do that. I also want to say one more thing on this. I think there are people who have, who have fashioned their Jesus after their preferences, mm -hmm. not after the Bible, mm -hmm. who jump from church to church to church to church causing pain and hardship every time they go to these different churches. And I think, I think these people, when they, people like that, and we've had some of those here, when they leave, I had a lady first Sunday at New Life, 26 years ago, first Sunday, I finished the sermon and a lady didn't like what I said, literally walked down to the front of the church, screamed at me for about five minutes. <laughs> and, and, and just, I mean, in front of the whole church just screamed at me because she didn't like what I said. Hmm. And she storms out of, the, out of the building. Now, God healed that later on. And some years later, I got to stand beside her as her daughter passed away and be, be the presence of Christ with her. Wow. But, but, she, but she did that. And there are a lot of people that do that. When people like that who have given into uh, a, 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 a Jesus made in their own image, when they leave, it is a blessed departure. Uh, yeah. I'm not, I'm, I'm not condemning anybody to hell. I don't have the authority. That's all God, you know, mm -hmm. but I'm like, you can get to heaven, but could you do it from somewhere else? And I'm not yeah. sure that's exactly, a, <laughs> I'm not sure that's a wrong way to feel. Right. One so. of the reason why I think we, we want to do these Bible studies is because we want to get to some of these verses that inevitably get taken out of context right. and used in different ways than they should be, or, or they were intended to be used like this one. Like, you know, they went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. I've heard pastors and ministry leaders say this about people who just, you know, 
didn't like the membership yeah. integrity covenant mm-hmm. or something. Well, and that's then, okay because they were never really saved church. anyway. They weren't yeah. saved yeah. anyway. <laughs> they weren't really of us. Yeah, you know, and it's it's just this dismissive yes. thing. But this is really talking about people who are actually denying Jesus, right? And what either denying his truth or denying his power. Yeah. So so use the statement regarding those right. people. Right. right. I also think it's important to remember John's writing to a very broken and confused church. Right. That yeah. is splitting, right? Because these people who, who are denying Jesus, denying that Jesus came in the flesh, right? Mm-hmm. So there's all these different ideas floating around. And I love the way he distinguishes the Antichrist from many Antichrists, right? right? And you did that in your teaching, too. Uh, you talked about the spirit of Antichrist yeah. versus, like, possibly maybe one day there's one guy or, right. or girl, whatever, that rises up and becomes the Antichrist. Um, further on that note, he goes down in, in verse 22, who is the liar? It is whoever denies that Jesus Christ, that Jesus is the Christ. Such a person is the Antichrist. So he, he doesn't just say there's one, right? He says this whoever right. uh, goes this route. And I think that's important for us to remember because it's not just going to be one person. And, and you said this in your teaching, mm. but it starts in the church a lot it of does. times and, and then leaks out. Well, the enemy there. just want the again, like I said in the, t- I, the enemy does is not going to jump to Theo, go murder somebody. Right. He's not going to do that. The enemy is going to start with, you know, this might not actually mean what you think it means. Mm-hmm. Maybe Jesus meant this over here. Maybe this over here is true too. And, and there's going to be this slow, mm, what's the word I'm looking for? Rationale yeah. mm-hmm. that takes you away ultimately yeah. from Christ. He goes in and in verse 22, he says, it is whoever denies that Jesus is the Christ. Mm-hmm. Such a person is the antichrist denying the father and the son. And that takes me back in my mind and mm-hmm. correct me if I'm wrong, but it's a callback to what we've been talking about previously where deny is not just with your mouth, right? right? right. It's in your actions. Right, Cause right, he talks yeah. about if you, if you claim to know God, but you don't live like it, you've not lived a, a changed life or you're not, right. then you, have no fellowship with him, right? Mm-hmm. So it's not just the literal, because as a kid, I, I used to wrestle with verses like this. Okay, so if someone just says out of their mouth, like, yeah, God is good, Jesus is good, is John saying that they're they're good to go? But then you have to call back to the first couple right. of chapters where he says, no, it's not just what you say, it's what you do, it's what you do. Right? and it's how you live. It's this balance. Mm-hmm. You, you, we, what we can't do is, if we go, okay, I fear a lot of things, right? I, I think every doctrine, every every church, has a a danger of becoming I, I w- I'll use the word arrogant a danger of arrogance right so we're I'm a we're a holiness church right I think inside of a holiness church there's a danger of arrogance that I'm holier than you and we become holier than thou yeah right inside of inside of Pentecostal churches mm-hmm. I worry that there's a danger the Holy Spirit said this to me and we're almost adding on to scripture you mm-hmm. see pastors do this they're almost creating new scripture and new theology and new mm-hmm. doctrine that's not in our Bible and and I think that's a danger inside of Calvinism or Baptist theology I, I think there's a danger well it, it's here though it, I think there's a danger that says they went out from us but they did not really belong to us for if they belonged to us they would have remained with us there's this danger of saying well if somebody actually walks away from the church they were never saved in the first place mm-hmm. I think that's a danger because what that yeah. says is my actions have no bearing on my salvation which means as long as I prayed this prayer I can live any way I want to mm. And, and I, you know, as long as I claim, as you mm-hmm. said earlier, as long as I just claim the name of Jesus, mm-hmm. I can live any way I want to. And I'm saved. See what John says? Yeah. You can't take th- those extremes are, are danger points inside of our doctrine. And, and I don't think that's what that's saying here. Yeah. I think there are some who are in our midst who, again, I'll go back to it. They want to create a Jesus in their own image. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They don't want a Jesus that is offensive to their friend's political position or their friend's personal position or their friend's actions. They want a Jesus that fits in with their friend group. They have not asked themselves if their friend group fits in with Jesus. Mm. That's good. And so, yeah. and, and that's what I think is going on here. Now he, uh, we, we, we've talked a little bit about verse 19 when it says they went out from us, but they ne- didn't really belong to us. We've talked about how people will use that out of context, right? right. Someone just left your church and you're mad now. It's okay. They were never really saved. They were never anyway. saved anyway. Now I want to, I want to flip that a little bit because we get down to, verse 27 I believe it is yeah he says as for you the anointing you received from him remains in you and you do not need anyone to teach you so what happens to the person that says that who looks at that and says yeah I'm leaving this church because I don't need the pastor's instruction one must balance scripture with scripture what John says here is absolutely true and and that's what I want to do you guys we've worked Mm -hmm. together long enough that you know that I, when we write sermons, I specifically want to write them, and I, I sometimes will jump all over the place. 
but I, but I very, I, that's not common with me. I want to stay in a scripture and I want to unpack that set of scripture because I want the people in the church to understand they can read the word of God. They can understand the word of God and, and that the Holy Spirit can teach them without us in the absence of this is true. The writer of Hebrews also says, do not, do not uh, forsake the gathering of yourselves together. He says you need to get together. The Bible consistently gives us moments where it says we need to be in community. We need to be holding each other strong. Mm -hmm. a, a strand of three cords is not easily broken, yeah. the Old Testament. And under authority. Yes, mm -hmm. and we need to be under authority, mm -hmm. very clear. And so, so I think that, and, and also, if they really truly did not need to hear preaching, then what's John's job? Mm. John's preaching. Yeah. So he obviously does not believe they don't need preaching because he's out there preaching it. Right. You know, and so and so he, what he's saying is quit being dependent on other people. The Holy Spirit can guide you. Yeah. Trust that. Yeah. Walk in the Holy Spirit. But be careful when you do that, not to slip over into spirit of Antichrist, where you think somehow because you have the Holy Spirit, you can redesign mm -hmm. what Jesus did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and I think the teaching that he's probably coming against, you know, anyone, not that you need anyone to teach you. I think mm -hmm. that teaching is probably some of these false teachers that are in the church. For sure. So it's like you don't need any of these guys to teach you any new revelation or any of the secret knowledge. Everything that you need has already been revealed, and it's yeah. all confirmed by the Holy Spirit who's in you. So you don't need to go find it anywhere else. You already know the truth. I think that's kind of what he's pointing at. He's like yeah. pointing them away from this aberrant, ridiculous theology. Yes, he's, he's likely coming against Gnosticism itself Absolutely. in these verses mm -hmm. because Gnosticism would say there's a special knowledge. Then this is very prevalent in the first century church. Mm -hmm. There's this special knowledge of the Holy Spirit. I can teach you that knowledge of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, and that's what he's been kind of tracing this whole yeah. time. You know, I want to jump into, um, go back to verse 23. You know, no one who denies the Son has the Father. Mm -hmm. um, you know, denying the, back a little bit, denying the Father and the Son. Uh, there's a movement of people right now, and it's been around for a long time, long before even I was a Christian, about people who are like, yeah, I'll follow Jesus, but this, this God of the Old Testament, he's reprehensible. Mm -hmm. I could never <laughs> follow him. It's not new, by the way. It's, it's been around a minute. Um, how, how do you respond to those folks? Because John seems to be pretty clear that the Father, you know, you have to have the, if, if you have the Son, you have the Father. If you have the Father, you have the Son. You can't deny one or the other and still be moving forward. Well, no, the, no, this teaching is, when we've been around for a minute, this teaching is from first, second century. Uh, I, I forget the name. It may be Marcion, it may be, I, I can't remember which mm -hmm. name. But, um, but this is from first, second century. Mm -hmm. It's been around since the beginning, where, where they said Jesus is now showing us the real God. Yeah. And the God of the Old Testament is evil and angry. Jesus exactly. is showing us that this, if you it's, take that kind of approach, you deny the father because Jesus says he is he, he's he's praying to the father. He's subordinate in in his human life here, subordinate mm -hmm. to the father. He says, I'm not here to to uh, erase any of the prophets or any of the teaching. Mm -hmm. Jesus endorses the Old Testament. Absolutely. And Jesus endorses the God of creation. And the Bible says, John says to us, beginning of first John, beginning of John, the gospel. Mm -hmm. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. That's Jesus. Jesus was there from mm -hmm. the beginning. Yeah. So so when people do things like that, and it's this is not the only theology that does that. Mm -hmm. People do things like that. They are again, y'all, you know what we're doing? We're repeating the children of Israel in the in the <laughs> desert, making a golden mm -hmm. calf. Over and over again. You know, yeah. we're trying to go back to our bondage, mm -hmm. getting rid of what can actually set us free. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, and I know that you're right. It's been around forever. What I meant to say is that it's almost like a new thing again. You know, yeah. it's, it just keeps it's kind resurfaced. of reinventing yeah. itself, like red letter Christians. Um, yeah. is one that I'm f referring yeah. to. Like the, back in the old days, they didn't have red letters, you know? Right. So that's something that we've done in the last however many, you know, 50 plus years of putting the G words of Jesus in red in a lot of Bibles, not all. But um, my point here is is to then talk about the different Trinitarian theologies real quick, because mm -hmm. I know right. there's been a lot of, there was a lot of development on Trinitarian theology in the first 300 years mm -hmm. Um, they finally, around the time of the Nicene Creed, made it very clear where they stood on Trinitarian theology. And the church has continued to build on that right. and help understand that the New Testament, at the very least, and especially the old, it's all there. Um, but there's people today that believe still 
that maybe the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit aren't three in one uh, coexisting persons that mm-hmm. have always been and always will be, but that they were different modes. Mm-hmm. So you'd have, you have you had the Father, you had the Son, and now there's the Holy Spirit. But the Father and Son were just modes of God that no longer are present. They were there for a time. They served their purpose. Now the Holy Spirit is the one. Well, um, what I wanted to say is that in, is, they seem to be trying to acknowledge that there's the Father and the Son, but that they're no longer here. Well, no, modalism, uh, which is what you're talking about, which really is born out of Arianism from, again, the, the mm-hmm. second century, I and believe. Sibelius and, and all these guys. Yes, and uh, so Arius and Athanasius had a huge debate yep. at, a, at one of the councils, and, and Athanasius won the debate, therefore Trinitarian theology took hold. Arius argued that Jesus, Arius argued against the idea of the Trinity. Modalism is what comes out of that. Mm-hmm. And modalism simply means that when I view God as creator and as Lord, as in charge of all things, I see him as God the Father. When I see God in his role as redeemer, as forgiver, I see him as God the Son. When I see God as that part inside of me that guides me, I view him as the Holy Spirit. Mm. So modalism would argue I'm just seeing God in different modes of who he is, in different parts of his personality. And, and that has made a comeback. Mm-hmm. It's, in, it's in a group, specifically in a group called Oneness Pentecostalism, mm-hmm. uh, it is really leaning hard into the modalistic view. Uh, of who God is. Now, the problem with that is that the Trinity itself allows, allows us to view a God that doesn't need us mm-hmm. because he lives inside community within himself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If, G, if you've got Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and the Son is not the Father, they are distinct. The Father is not the Holy Spirit, they are distinct. Then the Holy Spirit is not the, is not the Son, they are distinct, but they are all God. Mm-hmm. Now you have one, three in one, so you have community so every living being, part of being human, part of being real, mm. is a need for community. Amazing. And therefore, God lives in community within himself. Therefore, he doesn't need us. In modalism, God almost needs us because he needs someone to need him. Mm. God creates us because he needs us to complete him. Mm. In Trinitarian theology, God does not need us. Yeah. yeah. And therefore, it makes him fully independent as God. The last thing I wanted to talk about that's really good is, is anointing. This word is, mm. is coming up twice in this passage alone in our teaching yeah. today. Um, it's a word that you hear tossed around a lot yes. um, in modern Christian culture. And if you're new to the faith, you've no doubt already heard about anointing. Um, but the question is, what do you know about it? What does it mean to you? And I feel like it's used in a very specific way here that's different than the way that we hear in pop culture or in a lot of in church churches. Culture. So uh, can you speak to that a little bit and give us a little bit of insight onto what well, he's talking about versus what you hear people say? Again, think you've got to think in terms of the context in which the, the author, in which this apostle would have seen anointing take place. And when we see anointing modern, modern day, mm. uh, our view is that you are anointed, the oil represents the power of the Holy, the presence of the Holy Spirit, and so we, we kind of make a cross on your forehead, or we, it's a little schmear, right? <laughs> In his day, he would have seen an anointing that was different, mm-hmm. a pouring on until the, 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 the oil is dripping off the hair and off the beard, mm-hmm. uh, a pouring over, a covering mm-hmm. of. Right. So when he says you, you have an anointing that teaches you, what he's, the imagery is the oil still represents the presence of God, the presence of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament, the healing presence of God up until Acts chapter two, just the healing, the medicinal presence, all of that is there. But when you see it from his vantage point, that anointing that, that teaches us, that guides us, it, it, it covers, it saturates, it, I mean, how many days if you used a scented oil on your hair and it ran down your face and it soaked in your skin, how many days would you still smell that? Mm-hmm. In fact, can, can, can I give you a really cool analogy? Mm-hmm. Uh, or not analogy, it was a reality. When, 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 the, when Mary anoints Jesus with, with the oil, the perfume, right? It's running down his face. It's running through his beard. It, 
Have you ever thought about the fact that as the Roman soldiers were beating them, in their nose was this Aroma. perfume? Mm. Mm. As, as he's being crucified, the two, so the two criminals on either side are smelling this perfume. Yeah. When they take his body off the cross, they're still smelling that perfume. Mm -hmm. I mean, basically what you get is an anointing that, that penetrates, that saturates, and then that, that, that transforms the space around it. Mm. That's the way I view anointing as, as it's written here. It's not, it's not, oh, wow, I really enjoyed what you said. That's really mm -hmm. anointed. Yeah, okay, a, a, a sermon can be anointed or a sermon can be something you just enjoyed hearing. Mm -hmm. and, and you need to kind of know the difference. It's, it's also a protection, the anointing. It um, is. I, heard, I heard it said that uh, back when shepherds were leading sheep and, or taking care of the sheep, that they would anoint, anoint the sheep and they would use a special kind of oil that would protect the sheep from uh, different kind of worms and bugs mm -hmm. that would burrow into their skin, right? So this idea of anointing is also, and I believe this is what John's getting at, Holy Spirit is going to protect you. Right. If you lean into that, he's going to protect you from the false teachers, from the right. false doctrines, right? So not only is it the, the, the leading of Holy Spirit, but it's the protection of Holy Spirit right. from all mm -hmm. the other stuff. Versus what popularly is just talked about as power. Right. right. It's just like, oh, right. you're uniquely powerful because God, right. God's working through you, or I saw something that you did really good. And that's the part that I think he's not talking about. I think he's mm -hmm. talking about protection. Agreed. I think he's talking about this, this permeation, you know, of the Holy Spirit and all that you do, protecting you, empowering you. So I think that's really good. Yeah, I love the idea of oil protecting. It protects engines. It protects your skin. <laughs> it does. Um, you know, we use it as a protectant all the time. We never think about it as the Holy Spirit being our, our protector. But it does say elsewhere that he is the seal of, uh, mm. of redemption, right. you know, that this, that anointing kind of seals us oil kind of seals yeah. things from getting in, you know, That's or good. getting out. It's pretty awesome.